All right, let's finish our treatment of polyatomic molecules. So just a review that for the polyatomic, we've got our four components of the energy, translation, rotation, vibration, and electronic. The particle in a box gives us translational energy levels. It only depends on the mass of the particle, the polyatomic molecule that is, and on the volume that we just make a convention choice for, which dictates what the number is that we have for a partition function. For the uh, diatomic gas, we had a ground electronic state that was a dissociation energy. For the polyatomic, it's the sum of all the dissociation energies. And we have just finished working with the rotational uh, con contribution, and that depended on the three distinct moments of inertia, some of which could be equal to one another, but there was no requirement that they be equal to one another. So let's take a look now at the vibrations. And let me remind you, uh, when we looked at sort of the quantum mechanics of vibrations in the first, in, uh, in actually the second week, I think it was, uh, we divided up all the intramolecular motions, that's what a vibration is, into normal modes. And each of those normal modes could be solved using the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator Schrodinger equation. And when you do that then, the energy is determined as a sum over modes of the energy associated with each individual mode. And so here then the total vibrational energy is a sum over modes, j equals 1 to alpha, so there will be alpha normal modes. And recall for a linear molecule, alpha is 3n minus 5, where n is the number of atoms. And for a nonlinear molecule, it's 3n minus 6. Every one of those normal modes contributes Planck's constant times its characteristic vibrational frequency, so I've indexed it by j, where j is the normal mode that we're looking at, times n plus a half, where n is the quantum number associated with mode j. So is it in its ground state? Is it in its first excited state? Is it in its ninth excited state? Whatever it is. So n is the quantum number, and nu is the vibrational frequency. Well, Remember that a sum over energies gives rise to a product of partition functions, and so the vibrational partition function is expressed as a product, so capital pi means product, just as capital sigma means sum in mathematics. And so I take a product over the alpha normal modes of the partition functions of each of the individual modes. Right? And so if you recall from when we did a diatomic, this is what the partition function looks like. And when I carry out the differentiation of the log of the partition function with respect to temperature in order to get the expectation value for the energy, I'll get a completely equivalent expression as I got for a diatomic, except that I'll have a contribution from each one of the normal modes. So it's a sum over modes, and here's what you should remember from the energy expression for vibration for a diatomic. Similarly, if I do that for heat capacity, I will again have a sum of individual contributions to heat capacity associated with each one of the vibrations. So let's actually take a look at an example molecule uh, and see how these contributions add up. So here we have carbon dioxide. And so physical chemists for years have loved uh, to illustrate the vibrations of carbon dioxide. It involves two fists in your head, and you get to move the three particles in various ways as you do the vibrations. I can't resist doing it myself whenever I have an opportunity. But for today's purposes, uh, let's take a look at how these various normal modes contribute to the vibrational heat capacity. So this is a linear molecule, and so there are 3n minus 5 normal modes. And n is 3, so 3 times 3 is 9, minus 5, there should be four normal modes. And what are they? Well, there is a vertical bend and a horizontal bend, and they're being animated here. And they are degenerate with one another. That just which plane it's occurring in dictates whether we call it the horizontal or the vertical. That one occurs with the uh, lowest frequency, and hence the lowest vibrational temperature, 954 Kelvin. There's also a symmetric stretch, so that's the one the physical chemists like. You get to use your, your uh, fists and head. Uh, the symmetric stretch has a higher vibrational frequency and associated vibrational temperature, 1,890 Kelvin. And finally, the asymmetric stretch is the highest frequency, and it has a vibrational temperature of 3,360 Kelvin. And remember what happens as the temperature goes from low to high and passes through a vibrational temperature, 
the contribution of the heat capacity should go from zero to a factor of r. And so what I'm showing in this plot is simply color-coded by which of these various uh, uh, normal modes we're interested in, what is the contribution as we go from absolute zero, where actually it would be hard to have this gas, but on a graph it's not that hard to do, uh, up to a temperature of 2,000 Kelvin. So what you see, as expected then, is that for the lowest vibrational frequency, it gets up to its asymptotic value of R relatively quickly. The next lowest vibrational frequency does not ramp up as quickly, but we certainly can see it asymptotically approaching R. And as we only go out to 2,000 Kelvin here, but the vibrational temperature for the highest frequency motion is above 3,000, it's still rising steadily, and it will eventually asymptotically reach R, but we're not quite there yet. And so the heat capacity of this gas changes with temperature. As we go to higher and higher temperatures, the heat capacity is going up and up as these contributions are being added to the constant rotational and translational, which we'll remember is, you're thinking to yourself, right, five halves R for a linear molecule. All right, well, let's put all of it together and look at the ensemble partition functions for the full polyatomic ideal gas. In the linear case, we're going to have, for the molecular partition function, the translational component, the rotational component, the vibrational, and the electronic. In the nonlinear case, the difference is, I'll, I'll express it most generally for an asymmetric top, so the rotational piece looks a little different, and the sum, the number of normal modes in the vibrational piece is different. And when we go and we do the differentiations necessary to move from a full partition function to the internal energy, in this case the molar internal energy, we get the uh, expression shown here. So 5 halves RT for the linear case coming from translations and rotations, but 3 RT, an extra half RT because of the extra rotation in the nonlinear cases coming from translation and rotation. Again, a different sum over normal modes in the vibrational component. And if we now carry out differentiation with respect to temperature of the molar internal energy, we'll get the molar heat capacity at constant volume. Again, we'll see a 5 halves appearing in front of R for linear, a 3 appearing in front of R for nonlinear, and a different summation from the contributions of the normal modes. So, if you find this slide mildly imposing, I have to admit this is one of the more beautiful slides in the course. It certainly is loaded with Greek letters and Roman letters and exponents and really it's, it's a gorgeous piece of equation writing. No one memorizes these things, not the best statistical mechanician around. One goes and looks them up in books, but knowing how to work with them and use them effectively and remembering some of the conceptual aspects of how, say, a linear differs from a nonlinear uh, is really sort of the crucial take-home skill that one wants to get out of having done these derivations. So let's pause for a moment now and I'll let you see if you've acquired some of those skills and then we'll come back. All right, I'd like to wrap up by asking a question that after you've seen a huge slide full of math will often come into your head, I think, if you're an average everyday person and that is, does this all work? So let's look at a specific example. Let's look at a reasonably important molecule, water. And in particular, we're going to look at water at pretty high temperatures. So here in Kelvin, we're going to go from about room temperature. That's not that interesting a temperature. But uh, then we're going to take it up to, it looks like that's about 373 Kelvin right there. So that's the boiling point of water. And then we're going to keep taking the temperature up. So we're working with steam. And what I want to know is, what's the heat capacity of my steam associated with the vibrational contribution to the heat capacity. And I'll express that then in terms of R, how many factors of R are being contributed. So remember that water has 3n minus 6. It's a nonlinear molecule, normal modes. So there's three normal modes. It can contribute uh, you know, a fair amount to the uh, total heat capacity. And the rotational, so excuse me, the vibrational temperatures of those modes are given here. 2290, 5160, 5360. And so the heat capacity, actually I think the slide is labeled incorrectly here. This is the full heat capacity. So we're starting at 3. So 3 is the 3R associated with translations and rotations. But we're now going to add to that 
as the vibrations begin making their contributions because we're moving the temperature up because at low temperature they contribute nothing. So we ought to get from 3 up to 6. 6 would be an asymptote which is off the scale of this slide. But in any case, the calculation that comes from this expression that we have derived from first principles, if you like. We did quantum mechanics, we worked out partition functions for ideal gases, we made a prediction of what the heat capacity should be. Well, that's the line, so I'm just plotting this function. The points, the open circles, those are actual measurements of the heat capacity of steam, so very hot steam. And what you see is they fall very, very closely on the line effectively. So you might have thought to yourself, well, steam, how ideal a gas could steam possibly be? Well, surprisingly, the ideal gas approximation is working pretty well here. Maybe it shouldn't be surprising. Maybe people just thought it would be an ideal gas. But I think most people would say, oh, you know, water molecules, they interact with one another. The ideal gas approximation says they don't interact with one another. The quality of the ideal gas approximation is really remarkable. And finally, I want to come back again to, I talked about building a hammer last time. I think we might have a screwdriver here as well, because what does this graph really give you? Now, I, you, somebody did the measurements, that's where we got the points from, but let's say you hadn't done the measurements, and ahead of time you wanted to know, the answer to a very practical question, how much coal do I have to burn in order to get my steam from 700 degrees to 800 degrees? because maybe I want to power a steam engine, and I think hotter steam is going to give me more energy. Well, you would have been able to compute it from first principles. You would predict the heat capacity, and then you'd know how much energy it takes to raise the steam another 100 degrees. And so that's an extremely powerful tool of thermodynamics that can be put to practical use. So there is our steam engine. I didn't pick this steam engine randomly. It is a representative of the power of thermodynamics. It's pulling us further down the tracks. And we've pretty much wrapped up this week's uh, material, new material. So we'll spend one lecture reviewing what I think are the critical concepts before moving on in the course.